Hello and welcome everyone to another episode of Advent Preaching. And here we are blessed today to have my brother, fellow pastor, uh, Roger Hernandez. How are you? Very well, thank you. Uh, it's an honor for me to be here. Mm -hmm. It's an honor to have you. Uh, for those who may not um, be familiar with your position or what, what do you do? Introduce yourself to our audience. Yeah, my my uh, particular responsibility right now in the Vineyard is the evangelism director and ministerial for the Southern Union. Mm -hmm. So evangelism is just what it sounds like. I go around and do 10 to 12 evangelistic series um, during every uh, calendar year. Uh, my work, my wife works uh, with me as evangelism coordinator. And ministerial means that I'm the pastor's pastor for a thousand pastors. Wow. So we provide resources, encouragement. Um, we provide uh, uh, direction, uh, leadership, a listening ear, uh, support for for a thousand pastors in the Southern Union. Wow! Praise God! Praise God! Uh, pastor Hernandez, before we get in and jump into the conversation, uh, may we start with a quick word of prayer? Absolutely. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come to you again in prayer, and we ask you that you can just bless this conversation we're going to have, opening your word, fill our minds and hearts with your Holy Spirit, your grace, your love, and may many be blessed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So as we dive into the conversation of preaching, if you were to sum it up, because I know you recently did a video on the YouTube and it was amazing with the quick tips on preaching. What if, if you had a lay person or elder that came to you and said, Pastor, you know, I, I would like to preach. What quick tips would you give them in order for them to preach a, a powerful sermon? Well, a powerful sermon, uh, there's two types of preachers, right? Uh, some of them uh, who know Psalm 23 and some of them who know the shepherd, right? Um, and so it starts by knowing the shepherd. I, in order to preach Psalm 23, you have to know the shepherd of Psalm 23. So the first point is for you to know Jesus personally. It's possible for you to be a great uh, speech writer or speech presenter, um, but the difference between the anointing of the Holy Spirit and somebody who's very well gifted at speaking, right, is the is their relationship with Jesus. The relationship with Jesus is will will have the anointing in your life. And somebody who's anointed just preaches different. It might preach the same text, but it just it just feels different. It hits different. The response is different. Uh, so I'm uh, what I'm after is Jesus, and then I want to know what Jesus wants to tell the people. Right, so I, that would be the first thing. Uh, number two, I want to make it interesting, right? So, so I have I have the this triangle in my mind as I'm preaching. Number one, I'm connected to Christ, right? Number two, I want to make sure that the content is interesting. Right? If we make sermons not interesting, not only will people think we're not interesting, people will think God's not interesting. Mm -hmm. Right, so, and that's that's very that's a that's a high bar, right? Because you're not people are not going to say, yeah, Roger's not interesting. They'll say, you know, church's not interesting, meaning God's not interesting. Uh, God's not relevant to my life. God's not interested in what's happening to me. So I want to know. I want to see. All right, here's here's Christ. Here's my content, um, and then I want to make sure that they have something that they're going to do with what I am talking to them about. This is not just information. I want them, the community side is like, how does this affect this, this knowledge that I'm receiving? How does it affect my community? The people that I live with, the people that I connect with in the, in, in the person that cuts my hair, the person that fills my gas tank, the person that I that I work with, how does that? So I, I'm I'm always thinking about those three things as I'm preaching. Amen, amen. And I I know we recently spoke about a sermon you you just recently preached, 
right? And I'm excited. Can you can you bring us through that? Can you show us step by step how how did you bring that sermon together? How did that form and how did you preach that? All right. So the, the step by step is this. First of all, um, you're going to have as a preacher, you're going to have one of two sermons, right? One is somebody will tell you, Christopher, I need for you to preach for me. And what's your first question to that person? What an uh, what 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 do you want me to preach about? Right? Oh. Is there a sermon series mm -hmm. that you're going through? Is there uh, a topic that you want me to speak on? Um, so this particular sermon, the topic was assigned to me. Uh, they said we want you to preach out of Revelation seven. Right? So I said okay. You you will also have other times the people will say, hey Christopher, can you preach for me? And you'll say, sure, what's the topic? And they'll say, it's whatever the Holy Spirit gives you, right? Uh, so let, let's go first through an assigned topic. They'll tell you, I want you to preach from Revelation 7. All right, so I already have, I don't have to scan the Bible uh, to figure out what I'm going to preach. It's, it's a simpler way. That's why I encourage elders and leaders and pastors to have a sermonic calendar mm -hmm. because when you have a sermonic calendar, it takes away the guesswork and people are not just shooting buckshots everywhere, right? You do, it's more laser like, it's like, okay, this is what I'm, we have a theme, right? We have a, everything, every sermon builds on the other. Uh, so, any, you know, stop me anytime that you want for, for questions and, or, or comments or clarifications. So I have my, my topic, Revelation uh, 7. So I, I, I usually uh, fast when I'm preaching on Sabbath. I usually fast on Friday. I, I, I try to almost always, I never say always, but I, almost always I try to prepare my messages when I'm fasting. Um, because it's just um, clear of mind, right? It, it just mm -hmm. takes takes away the encumbrances so God can speak clearly. Um, so that, that I, I usually have three points in my sermon, right? But I always preach with points. Uh, this particular sermon has four. So it's rare for me as a preacher to have four points. I like three. Why three? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, sea, land, and sky. I, I think there's lots of scripture, but the number three is significant. <coughs> it's easy to remember. When somebody, um, uh, when a person is, uh, is giving a speech in the secular world, um, you see that very good, people that are very good will, will talk in, in, in threes. Um, and, and, and also one of the threes goes in a different direction than the other two. It's like last night I had dinner with my daughter, my wife, and my greatest enemy, right? So you, it, it's like, so you expect my daughter, my wife, and my mother-in-law. No, no, it's my daughter, my wife, and my greatest enemy. So you switch it around. So I like, I like threes. I like points because points help me to stay on track. Um, uh, Christopher, I believe that the gospel is eternal, but, but the sermons don't have to be. Right? Um, the longer somebody preaches, the less they prepared. I just found that consistently. Uh, if, if you cannot say it in 35 to 40 minutes, um, you, uh, I think you still need to polish it. Uh, these long drawn out, it means you have too much information. It's not really focused. Um, you probably went on different rabbit trails. Uh, so I like points and I like to tell people what I'm going to preach, then preach what I said I was going to preach, then remind them what I just preached about, then make a call. All right. That's, that's my process. So this particular sermon, I, I, um, the key thought, this is something that I've written for myself. What's my key 
main thought that I'm going to develop in these four points. The people that make it in the end. So I want to make it in the end, right? Do you want to make it in the end, Christopher? All right? Or you just want to, you, want to, you don't want to be left outside holding the bag, right? You want to be make, so who, who, what characteristics does Revelation 7 give us about the people that make it in the end? Right? Because there's a lot of misinformation and, and a lot of angst about, like, is it only 144,000? Is it, is it one in a hundred? Is it one in 20? Is it a million people? Is it only Adventists? It, who's going to make it in the end? So the people that make it in the end have something clear. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Right? These multicultural gospel-drenched survivors who love serving. So right there, I gave you my four points. This is for me. Multicultural gospel drench survivors who love serving those are my four points recognize that at the end of the day i won't be proud of my ability but god's salvific power all right so that's for me I've, i i want to write down what i'm preaching about so i know that I'll, I'll be able to give an elevator speech if I tell you, Christopher, uh, what are you preaching this weekend? And you go into a long run out, you, you don't know what you're going to preach about yet. Right? I, you have to be able to tell me, okay, this week, this is what I want them to know. This is what I want them to feel. This is what I want them to do. Three questions. What do I want them to know? What do I want them to feel? What do I want them to do? I summarize my sermon. If somebody wants to write this down that who's watching this, the objective of every one of my sermons, I summarize all my messages in two words. Helpful, truth. And it has to have both of those. If something is just helpful, but it's not truth, in other words, based on scripture, it's just self-help. Right? And I can get a lot of self-help books that are better than my preaching. If something is truth, but it's not helping anybody, and, and people say, well, all truth is helpful. Not really. I would never give a breastfeeding seminar in a retirement home, even though it's true. It's not helping anybody there. So it has to have this. If it has neither of them, then you just, you just wasted people's 40 minutes. So it has to have these two components. It has to be helpful and it has to be true. Uh, so I always start with an illustration or a quote. I, I want to grab the, their attention immediately. So I say something they're not expecting. I give a quote that will make them say, hmm, or I don't know about that. Or I'll ask a question. Uh, have you ever thought? In a sermon, for example, that I preach on failure, uh, I start my sermon by saying, I'm going to give you 15 seconds, seconds to think about the worst failure you've ever had. And I just, and I, sh I start my sermon like that, and I just shut up. I shut up for 15 seconds, and I let them think. And then I go into the passage. So I start off uh, with an illustration, and I talk about Revelation. And I say, Revelation... Uh, people, some people see Revelation, um, and I'm going to use a word, because I preached this sermon in Spanish. I'm going to use a word. I don't know what the translation is in English or whether the illustration translates into English, but I'm just going to tell you what, it's, what it does for a Spanish audience, right? Uh, you, know, are you Have you ever heard the, the expression chancleta? Uh, yes, that's right. So, so, people think, so people think some people th think that the book of revelation is your mom's chancleta right that that she used to 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 spank to spank you it's like okay, you you want to get some of this huh you better behave the the book of revelation is not a chancleta mm -hmm. right the book of revelation is not a zoo a slipper is not a slipper to slap yeah. people with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. mm -hmm. 
uh, it, it, the book of Revelation is not a chancleta and it's not a zoo. Mm -hmm. right? It's not a slipper and it's not a zoo, right? Where like the main emphasis is, is all these beasts that are coming out of everywhere um, and, and Jesus is forgotten. The book of Revelation, the central message starts in the beginning is Jesus, right? right? So understanding Jesus, let's think about the Jesus followers have four things. And then I go into my four points. Number one, I read the text, right? After this, I saw a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation and every tribe and people and language standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes and held, and held palm branches in their hand. Um, here's, a, here's another tidbit. I preach from a translation that people can understand. I'm not trying to coddle the saints. I'm trying to reach the people who are far from God. Right? So I want, if they don't understand that, and I'm, I'm, uh, notice, I'm not criticizing. Somebody wants to preach from the old King James. Knock yourself out. Right? But it's, there's a lot of Bible, non-Bible understanding people in the world. Right? Bible knowledge is at its lowest ever. So when I preach about the hither dither, right, it, it's going to be, re I will have, I see pastors do this. They read the text, then they have to explain what the text means. The word, the wording, like not, not the meaning of the text, but the, like this old English. So you, you, you're removing people two steps from the meaning of the text. Just read the text instead of come ye hither, just say, hey, come here. It just, who who talks like that now though? Who says, "Come ye hither"? Uh, so, I want them to understand what I'm reading. So I read the text, right? Um, they were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hand. Okay. So here's four points. Number one, the people who are going to be saved at the end. It's a multicultural expression, right? It's interesting that he sees heaven. And when um, people say, yeah, I don't see color. I don't see color. I see everybody the same. Well, obviously, um, this, this passage will, will say something different. It's not about seeing color or not seeing color. It's about celebrating everybody's color, where everybody is the same. So if I, if I tell you, Christopher, hey, go, go to that city about five minutes from here. And there's going to be a ballroom. There's going to be a lot of people there. Report to me what you see. And you tell me, hey, there were Dominicans there. And there were, um, you know, Texans there. Um, and there were, there were Africans there. And, and there were Chinese people there. How do you know that happened? Right? You, you, you went in there. You looked. You heard them talk. So you saw that they were different. Right? So here's the illustration that I use. For this multicultural expression, I'll go through this four very quickly. Um, of course, you know, in the in the actual message, I, I go uh, deeper and further, right? This this multicultural expression number one, the illustration I use is um, here's here's two differences. Some people want the church to be as a puree, right? But when I was sick to my stomach, my mom would put all these roots, right? Um, we call them malanga and potatoes and, and all these roots. They would put them inside a blender and blend it. Shh. You know, it, what it came out is a puree, just nondescript color. And people think that the church should be like that. But we all, it's a puree. Um, I like to think of it more, which I think is more consistent with scripture, as a salad. Right? In a salad, you put lettuce and tomato and jalapenos and you put black olives. And you mix it together, but every single element keeps its distinctiveness, even it's in the even though it's in the same bowl, right? So, so I, I I think that we don't have to erase who we are to have unity, right? So, you want you want to make it to heaven? You're gonna to work to make sure that you see people here. And you say, well, I don't, I don't see color. In other, in other words, I don't, I, I'm, I'm oblivious to what, 
to your particular uh, background and experiences. Number one, okay? Um, number two, the people who are going to make it to heaven are going to be clear on the gospel. They're going to be clear on the gospel. Notice the text, verse 10. And they were shouting with a great roar. Salvation comes from our Lord who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. The redeeming, uh, the redeemed are the shouting time. Right? They're, they're clear on the gospel. They understand it's not you plus Jesus. It's not that Jesus does some parts and you do the other parts. The only the, the, What you bring to this equation of salvation is the sin that made it necessary. The Bible, doesn't, the Bible doesn't describe the gospel as somebody who's bad, then then the gospel makes good. The gospel is not that God takes a, 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 a bad man and makes him good. The gospel is that God takes a dead person and makes him alive, right? All I bring to this equation is a stink. So people say, well, isn't that cheap grace? You know what cheap grace is? It's for Jesus to have died for your sins, right? As a sacrifice for you and you thinking to yourself, I had to add something to that sacrifice. That's cheapening grace, right? So, so the... The people who are going to be standing up at the end understand that salvation belongs to our Lord. So what that means is I don't get to choose who comes to the church or not. I don't get to choose who goes, who goes to heaven or not. So in heaven, I'm going to see people that I didn't really expect to be there. And, and But I'm also going to see people in my family who are going to make it there. And, and the greatest surprise for some of us is going to be that we're, we made it there. So I'm glad that my it's not my decision, it's God's decision. He gets to decide who is saved. And my, my, my uh, responsibility is to respond to his grace and say, yes, I recognize I'm a sinner. I have nothing to offer for the, but this brokenness. Here I give myself completely. Multicultural expression. Clear on the gospel. Number three, they have a high tolerance for pain. Okay. In verse 14, it says, then he said to me, these are the ones who died in the great tribulation or came out of the great tribulation, right? So the people that are going to be in heaven, uh, Christianity hits different when you've gone through stuff. When, you, when you've come from something, when you've gone through something, right? When, when, you, when you said, um, so it, it has cost me something to follow Jesus. So it, it increase when something costs you something, it increases the value, right? Tribulation or going through tribulation doesn't save you, but it perfects you. You understand God's power in a different way. But my daughter, here's an illustration. My daughter uh, was uh, uh, she's married. And uh, they were going to school. They had no money. No money. Zero money. Zero money. Are you ever identified, Christopher, with having no money? Going to school? <laughs> yeah, no money. We had no money. And she would send me screenshots of her bank account with like $3.50 in it. So every time she would do that, what would I do as a dad is, is just cash app or some money, right? Enseñar. <laughs> you know, I just cash up you someone. Uh, and and my wife said, Roger, you need, to, you need to stop that. And I was like, why? Why don't you stop that? He's like, well, every time your daughter has a financial issue, you send her money. And my, my wife said something very profound. She said, by you being the one who always provide her needs, you're robbing her of the opportunity to depend solely on Jesus. You're robbing her from the opportunity to understand God's power by herself. And I was like, man, why are you, why are you always making so much sense? And, and you said, we, we're going to be there as a backup for emergencies, but let her find out how God 
bless it, somebody who is faithful because my Amen. you know my daughter's faithful in her tithes and offerings and 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 I did that right God told us we were going to have tribulation so at the end people who have would have come out from something right they have a high tolerance for pain the Bible calls it the great tribulation right um so I, I in that section I just talk about tribulations that we might be having right now because I want to connect with the audience, right? Like I use this, I always use this phrase, Christopher. I always use this phrase. I use, maybe I'm talking to somebody. And then I just imagine who I'm talking to. Maybe I'm talking to somebody. I'm talking to an older crowd. I'm talking to somebody whose kids have just disconnected from the church and it's troubling you. Maybe I'm talking to somebody who has been told by the doctor that they have cancer and it's terminal or whatever it is that he said that you have, you're not going to be able to be healed from it. You go into tribulation, your trouble, this troubling your spirit. Maybe I'm talking to somebody whose spouse just died. Maybe I'm talking to somebody right now <coughs> who's been let go. Maybe I'm talking to somebody who's anxious about a relationship, a job, school. And I just try to try to cover as many people as I can, right? Um, the Bible says these are the ones that have come out of the great tribulation. You've come in, but if you, as somebody said, if you, if you're going through hell, keep walking, you're going to come out. Amen. The same God that brought you in will take you out. There's always a way out. High tolerance for pain. And then the last one, um, remember, I want them to feel something. I want them to know something. I want them to do something. My last one is. People who are going to be standing in the end are people who serve enthusiastically. Verse 15 says, that's why they stand in front of God's throne and serve him day and night. These are not spectators. We have a lot of consumers in church right now. Give me a sermon. Sing me the songs I like. Tell me what I want to hear. Help me. Minister to me. Bless me. Well, I don't know. That music didn't bless me. But who said it was about you? Well, that, that sermon didn't bless me. But who said that sermon was about you? Who said church was about you in the first place? I don't go to church so I can receive a blessing. I go to church so I can be a blessing. Amen. I want to, I want to, I'm there to minister to people. I already, um, I've already eaten, right? I'm, when I go to church, I'm not starving. I've already eaten before. It's like when you go over to somebody's house and you're not sure about the food, you eat first, right? Before you go, um, just to make sure you don't, you don't starve. I, 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 I ate before I went to, I ate before I went to church. I, I've been feeding on the word. So I'm there for the people who have not eaten so I can bless them, right? Uh, these people are serve enthusiastic. They're not consumers. They understand they're part of the church. They're owners. They're servers. Um, service is a lot. Churches are, are, are like watching a football game. There's 22 people in desperate need of rest being watched by 22,000 people in, def in desperate need of exercise. Uh, so I, I want to I wanna use this message to call people to serve. Amen. How can you get involved? What can you do? You don't have to do everything, but you do have to do something. Mm -hmm. right? If the first, if Ellen White talks about the first inclination of a saved heart is to share the gospel and you're not sharing, not sharing the gospel, then I have to ask myself, uh, am I really understanding salvation? Am I really understanding what the gospel means? Right? It's not just what the gospel provides, what the gospel motivates me to do. So I'll, I always go back to the root, right? the root which is the gospel and then i make the invitation right i i always make a call i always make a call always um uh, well what what if people don't come and what if people don't respond be less worried about your reputation and more worried about people having an opportunity to respond it's not your job for them to respond you don't you don't become a success. It's not your success is not predicated on people's responses. Amen. It's predicated on you following 
your responsibility of making an invitation. Jesus, the king of the universe, made invitations that people didn't accept. They said, you need to leave here. Okay? we we rather have our pigs. Sometimes you have people that say, we rather have our pigs in church. But, you, you know, it's your job to make the invitation anyway, to minister to them anyway, to invite them to do something. So what do I want them to do with this message? I want them, number one, to make sure they reach out to somebody who's different than them. I want to invi make... Wanna, I wanna Make the invitation that they they go back to their first love, that they're clear on their understanding of the gospel. I want them to know that God is with them in the pain to keep going, to not give up right now. And I and I'm inviting them to to serve. So I will preach this before maybe an evangelistic series. Uh, you know, three months out or six months out or nine months out, so I can get people involved. Maybe during nominating committee season. Um, where I say, hey, if God has done something to you, what are we, for you, what are we going to do for our community? And then I'll make the invitation. Sometimes it's raised hands. Sometimes it's standing up. Sometimes it's coming to the front. Sometimes it's filling out a card. Uh, some, sometimes it's just, go, you know, go on our knees. But I always make an invitation. I never leave without making an invitation. Then I pray. And then I go have some nice, good potluck in, uh, in the church. So that's that's a sermon. Any questions? No, I um I was blessed by it. You were just preaching and I'm receiving the gospel right now. So that was a blessing because no, as you were going through it, you know, it was just it's a blessing how you went through from I was looking at it in uh when it says before the throne, clothed in white robes with palm branches, and then crying out a loud voice, salvation belongs to God. So I really love that because it just shows us how important it is for us to understand that the gospel is not about us and then when you went down and then you talked about uh and serve him day and night in his temple you know that really hit me because it's not about us you know it's not about us it's just about jesus so no that's a blessing and and i was truly blessed by this i don't i don't have any um how do you edit like, all right, you, you have that sermon, you have it already planned out. When you said it's supposed to be from 30 to 45 minutes, you have all these notes. How do you know what to leave in and what to take out? Um, that That is a very difficult thing. And the more you do it, the easier it gets. Okay. Right? Um, so I just want to make sure, I ask myself, is this a rabbit trail? Right? Is this too much information? Am I just repeating the same thing in a different way? What's the simplest way to say this? That's why it's important for you to practice your messages, especially if somebody's just starting out or doesn't have a lot of experience. Get in front of a mirror or in front of a camera and record yourself. People say, well, I don't, I don't like hearing my voice. Well, but you want us to hear your voice. Like, what, what, how does that fare, bro? Like, you want me to hear you, but you don't want to hear yourself? What kind of stuff is this? Uh, record yourself. And then you will see, because how it sounds in your mind is different from what it sounds when you preach it. Mm -hmm. So preach it and see, and see. okay, all right, let me just preach it like if I was preaching it. Well, that took 50 minutes. That's too long. What, what can I cut without taking out the you know the the main element the main point of my point what illustration what was my illustration too long can i have a different illustration uh do i have many sub points in my in my main point uh what can i leave out um there, there was a farmer that went to church and he was the only one in attendance right and the preacher said there's only you and me here and he said yeah preach anyway he said when i when i have my cows and only one comes to eat i still feed it right and the preacher said all right so he preached a sermon is an hour and a half and at the end he asked the farmer he said how how did i do he said listen 
when I have a, when I'm, when it's feeding time and only one cow comes, I feed it, but I don't feed it all the feed. Like I just, I just feed it. I just feed it some of the feed. So he was telling the pastor, listen, you, you, yeah, you have to give me every single detail, right? A lot of, uh, people sometimes want to go into the Greek and the Greek says this and the Greek says that. People in the pew, uh, most of them, you know, the majority of people that attend church have a sixth grade reading education. Um, this only confuses most of them. There's only two or three people in the church that just want you to go deep into the Greek and the Hebrew. Do it. I do this for me. Like I look at the Greek word for me and the Hebrew for me. So I understand it so I can be able to, to present it, right? I, I want to, Ellen White says that Jesus' messages were simple, right? I don't want people to, the Bible did not say, feed my, feed my giraffes. Jesus said, feed my sheep, right? So I cut out as much as I can without compromising the integrity. And, and the only way to know that for you to preach it how do you know if you cut too much well you preach it and it, it was only 20 minutes well maybe you have to put some stuff back in preach it until it's the right amount of time practice right practice doesn't make you perfect practice makes you prepared amen so practice it amen See yourself as you're talking and now preaching on camera. You know, people that, that right now have to preach to Zoom and stuff. You have, you have to over exaggerate so it come so it looks normal. And it's one thing about preaching in camp uh, uh, doing you know through through the camera. You have to over exaggerate your voice and your inflection and, and your mannerism so it comes out normal. Because if you're just talking in a normal voice, it comes out as monotone. And uh, I was, I was, uh, I had an interview with uh, Nona Jones from Facebook. She's a faith groups director for Facebook. And she said, people have three second attention spans. That's what you got. So wow. when you first start preaching and you go into a story like, hey, how's everybody today? Or, how's, how's it going today? How's the, how are the people of God today? You just lost you just lost half your audience, especially a younger generation. The younger they are, the less, um, uh, you know, engaged they are. So come out like Mike Tyson. I hate, I don't watch boxing, but when I used to watch boxing, I hate, I, you hate those boxers that come in and start dancing. Like, um, did I pay money to watch in pay-per-view to watch you dance or, or to hit each other? Right. Just Mike Tyson back in the you know 80s and 90s, he would come out, fights would last eight seconds. He would come out swinging. He would go ding, he would go, hey, here we go. So stop with all the fluff and all the greetings and all the how's everybody today? What's going on? And sister, and thank you very much, such and such. And I'm so glad that I'm be here. And it's a great drive here, and it's a great duty. God gave us a, a great day today. And by the time you start your message, you know, three to five minutes after that, people are on their phones. And then you have to try to recover that. So just pray and just start. Just run. Fight. That's a blessing. That's a blessing. You know, um, like I was, I was blessed you by this, uh, this interview, you know, sitting here with you. Um, it's a blessing, you know, it, I could be a student and just listen. And you're, you're so right about that. You just have to go in because it's so difficult nowadays with preaching with the attention spans, especially with technology and these phones. They, the minute, the minute they feel as if like, it's not what they are looking for, or they, they're not grabbed in to the story or something. They, they have the easiest escape right here, right, right on the phones. Um, Pastor, this was a blessing. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, like taking us through Revelation 7. I'm, I'm looking at Revelation 7 from a whole nother perspective now because you, you made it simple. 
Like I was able in just this last few minutes, I was able to process what your sermon was for Revelation 7. And it, it seems just so much more beautiful because it's the gospel right here. You know, right here in Revelation 7. Um, any last words before we close? Any last tips? Anything on your mind that we forgot? Yeah, I, I think that um, before before you preach, you have to ask yourself about the people you're preaching to. Mm -hmm. What are their needs? Mm -hmm. What are their fears? What are their dreams? Mm -hmm. um, what are their goals? Um, what are their hurts? What are their pains? What are their traumas? Right? If you speak to people's needs, you will always have an audience. Amen. The reason why people disconnect is because you're preaching over here and people are over here. Mm -hmm. You have nothing to do with each other, right? And I don't, I, I see preachers making this mistake. They go through the text and pull out all the, the, the text and go through the, what the text says, and they spend the first half of the sermon in the text, and then they go into application. I think the way to preach today is information, application, information, application, information, application, all throughout from the beginning. Wow. Information, application, information, application, because that connects me to the text and, make, and brings me in that biblical story and speaks to my soul. Wow. And remember, a sermon without Jesus is just a speech. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, wow. that last point you made really hit me because I always wonder, do we talk about the historic time first and then you bring it to modern day? Because that's what a lot of those um, old preaching textbooks would say. You build a bridge. But then yeah. when you when you say it like that, that makes so much sense because you break down the information, even if you talk about the historic time, but then you connect it today, you're grabbing them in all every moment throughout the sermon because the, uh, the question they ask is like well, how does this have to do with me why yeah. does this matter so that that is a very um, i'm gonna try that for my next sermon to, let, let, you know? let, let me let me give you an example of how i do it mm -hmm. like um for example i'll do like this and this just takes 60 seconds i'll say um the for example we we put a uh on the screen, Philippians 1, 6, right? Mm -hmm. The one who began the work, good work in you. Uh, they say, all right, the, the text, um, the, the, let, let, let's read Philippians uh, 1, 6. Uh, Philippians uh, were some people. It was, a, it was a town, it was a church that, that Paul wrote to. This, this letter right here was written by Paul. Paul was a really bad dude. Paul was a straight up killer. Paul used to hate people. He used to go into people's homes and kill children. Can you imagine? Well, some of you have done some really bad things and you wonder if the grace of God has hit you. Let me tell you what, what, what God can do with, with a guy like, like you. And, I, and then I'll read the text. Amen. It took 15 seconds. It took 20 seconds. But I brought them into the pause versus like, that's Philippians. That's old time. That's not does not relate to me. Now I'm reading through the eyes of somebody because there's somebody in the audience who's who's listening to you, who's wondering if God's grace can still get to him because they've messed up. They said, you know, I, do you know any really bad people? God can change him. Do you feel like a really bad person? Here, here's, what, here's what the text. So it's information, application, information, application. I always, that's why I say First John, the book of Revelation, so let, let's, let's read Revelation 7. You know, Revelation 7 is not like your mom chancleta. It's not meant to scare you. Like, don't be scared about this text. This is what it, te this is what it says. That, how long did that take? It, takes, it took 10 seconds, right? But it's information application, information application. So I'm, now I'm diving into this text because I'm thinking about my mom chancleta and uh, how I don't need to be scared or so whatever. When I talk about the great tribulation, I remember, well, this is in the context of Jesus. This is not, I'm not, I'm not gonna be scared of this chancleta that's coming towards me. That that's how that's how you do it. Amen. Amen. Um, we're gonna I'm gonna have to try to get on your schedule. We can probably do 10 more of these because the insight that you gave, like you could be our preaching mentor right here, you know. Um, before we close, could you please say a prayer, Pastor, just for all the yeah. preachers who are gonna watch this? 
for our ministries and for us to preach Jesus. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity, the blessing, and the privilege to preach about you, from you, to the people. Allow us to have a connection and experience with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you all for watching this. You can see more interviews like this and get many great tips on preaching at adventpreaching.com. Thank you all. Thank you all.